And up next, we are going to hear from Dr. Carissa Gable. She is an associate professor in the Division of Neuromuscular Medicine at Duke University School of Medicine. She's board certified in neuromuscular medicine, neurology, and electrodiagnostic medicine, and is the director of the Neuromuscular Fellowship Program. So Dr. Gable, thank you for being with us this Saturday. I will let you go ahead and present your talk. All right, sounds good. Thanks for, all right. All right, great. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I think uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the benefits of continuity care in the MDA clinic today. And just as you know, a reminder for some who don't know all the things that we typically see in our MDA clinic, this is a category of um, all the typically, a lot of times genetic also acquired uh, muscular dystrophies and myopathies and motor neuron disease, ion channel diseases, mitochondrial diseases, neuromuscular junction, and peripheral nerve. So I'll start by saying that uh, multidisciplinary disciplinary care is really the standard of care. Uh, and for a number of reasons, I'll go into a little bit more detail, but improved quality of life is one. Um, you know, access to individualized resources, improved health outcomes, and our continuing care with ongoing medical management, and then of course research, research opportunities and treatment advances as well. And so this concept of care model really is so important for improving communication amongst providers. I don't know if you've been, you know, in a scenario where you go see one doctor here and you go see another one there and then no one's talking to one another and then, you know, the therapist is somewhere else. And, and so you're kind of going to all these places and no one's kind of communicating. They send notes back and forth, but there's not that kind of, you know, in-person communication that is so key to sort of getting to know the patients and what they need, but also communicating amongst the providers to kind of come to consensus kind of more efficiently and quickly about what's really needed. Um, and so, uh, you know, and so I think that's so important and that's really part of the key part of this concept of care model is communication is so key for improving quality and efficiency of, of care. And it's hard to measure value, but I think this ends up being a better value ultimately because it's just, it's just such a better way to go about doing things and it's, it, rather than compartmentalizing into different silos of kind of care uh, models. And so I think, you know, another aspect that's really important is the increased adherence to clinical care guidelines. Oftentimes MDA clinics are in tertiary care centers. And so those providers are more in tune with the updated clinical care guidelines. They're aware of sort of the rarity of these disease processes and what needs to be looked at in anticipation of, uh, rather than in reaction to what happens along the disease course. And so, for example, say with myotonic dystrophy type 1, knowing when to or how often to check for uh, increased uh, glucose levels or thyroid disease that's known to have an increased incidence in that population of patients um, and knowing how often to send a patient to get cardiac monitoring and screening rather than reacting to you know the arrhythmia or cardiomyopathy that happens later you can kind of anticipate that which I go into a little bit more as well but having those clinical care guidelines uh, available and can be knowledgeable about that is really important and that's the kind of thing that you also would typically come across in sort of an MDA clinic, I think. Um, and then also more efficient resource utilization. So, uh, you know, for say, if you're in a community and you need an ankle foot orthotic and you go and, uh, you know, see someone and they get some off the shelf model that doesn't really work for you and doesn't fit. And then you're going back and forth to different orthotists to try to work that out. And, you know, ultimately that's not really good resource utilization for your time, but also for the actual like, bracing and everyone else, you know, involved and kind of all the travel that's involved with that is just not a good model. And so having, you know, a, a therapist who's in the clinic with us who can assess that, who's knowledgeable about the disease process, can pick the right kind of custom model that you need is much more efficient use of time and care delivery, but also resource utilization, I think, as well. Um, and so this is sort of a typical team that you would see in an MDA clinic. Um, and I would just emphasize again the communication amongst everyone and the team of cohesion is so key. And I know that's how our clinic here runs so well. And so typically, you know, you'll have some physical medicine rehab uh, providers, but here our neuromuscular medicine uh, runs our MDA clinic. And so uh, we have the neurologist here. In our MDA clinic here, we have a physical therapist and occupational therapist on a weekly basis. We're here every week doing our clinic. Um, social work is available. 
Um, genetics is very important as well, which I kind of talk about a little bit later. Um, cardiology and pulmonary, we don't have in our adult MDA clinic. We actually have that uh, those providers on site in our pediatric MDA clinic here. Um, but I think uh, we have you know, a referral base and connective network within our system for, for people who are familiar with these diseases that we refer to frequently. So we have them on our team, but maybe not physically in the clinic. And then um, of course our MDA staff support in the clinic and then our nurse coordinator, who our nurse here is just so amazing. And she is so key in helping all of us like work well together and keeping everything coordinated, running the um, board and the team and everything. So on the day of clinic and, and making reaching out to patients, um, she's just really, really great. So having that team cohesion and that strong communication is so key. And this is kind of a typical team that you would come across in the MDA clinic. Um, this is sort of an overview from the Developing Multidisciplinary Clinics Neuromuscular Care Research paper that was published a little bit ago by Sabrina Paganoni's group. And this really refers to children with muscular dystrophy, but also you know, pediatric uh, patients grow up and go into adult MDA clinic too. So uh, it's really relevant, I think, for, um, for both groups. And so this is sort of assessing, you know, giving you an idea of what we're thinking about for uh, what we assess and the interventions that might be required depending on you know, what's going on along the way with the disease process. And so, um, so neurology, uh, maybe once or twice a year, depending on the needs that are involved. Um, initially, after diagnosis, you have you know, medication management and then anticipatory guidance of kind of anticipating what the issues might arise before they actually become too problematic. And of course, coordination of care as well is really um, important, kind of knowing when to send uh, you to go see cardiology or pulmonary um, before the situation is so dire that you have to be admitted to the hospital or something like that. Um, so kind of anticipating those needs. Um, so at least once a year is important um, to kind of touch base. Um, of course, like reaching out via, you know, the electronic medical record and like our MyChart system is really a great system to be able to kind of directly communicate as well. But seeing uh, once a year in person really makes all the difference. And um, so there's that. And then the pulmonologist. So at least once or twice a year, depending on the needs of whatever um, disease process there is or how far along things are. A baseline pulmonary function tests are really key for kind of understanding where things are at and then a sleep study as well, sometimes for say the myotonic uh, patients that have issues with sleep apnea, kind of assessing those and kind of seeing where those are at or assessments that we frequently recommend at least once a year for monitoring. And intervention, so kind of this goes along with anticipatory guidance of knowing when uh, you know, inhalers would be helpful, knowing when to initiate a cough assist device, knowing when to initiate non-invasive like BiPAP ventilation or invasive ventilation. And so having that sort of uh, connectivity with the neurology group, but also our pulmonary or pulmonologist is really helpful for kind of anticipating those needs as you go along. Um, cardiology is very important specialty that we uh, work with frequently and at least always recommend like for a lot of the folks once a year for getting an EKG and echocardiogram to kind of anticipate when the need might be for a pacemaker placement or to monitor for that cardiomyopathy that's evolving potentially so you can kind of initiate the appropriate medication treatment for that. Um, so that's a very important one to kind of keep in mind that we use frequently coordinate care with in that specialty. Um, endocrinology is used a little bit less frequently in the adult world. Um, I think that a scenario where I could imagine that would be useful is someone who has like, an, like a CMT or inherited neuropathy and also has really bad kind of issues with diabetes. And so you have an acquired neuropathy on top of an inherited neuropathy. You really need to get the diabetes under control so it doesn't make all the symptoms a lot worse. And so that might be a scenario where I would recommend seeing endocrinology um, maybe once or a year once things are kind of sorted out. Um, orthopedic surgery at, sort of as needed depending on the situation for scoliosis management sometimes is really helpful in the adult world. Um, ankle and joint issues can come up from time to time. I have one scenario of a patient that I saw in clinic when I first started working here that um, had a, a major orthopedic issue that we sort of helped them sort out. Uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy are really key. Uh, that is a that really helps with the functional evaluation and ongoing treatment throughout the the year. And um, for those patients who need advice on uh, 
stretching and strengthening and how to go about doing those and, and working with a therapist who's really familiar with these disease processes and that, you know, discharging them from clinic, like immediately and saying there's no progression or um, improvement when that's not really what's needed. Uh, mobility evaluation is really important. And of course, equipment need assessment is really important. So that's very helpful. Um, even if sometimes you don't think like, you know, you need anything with a bracing, um, they might pick up on something that you didn't realize might help things move along more quickly. I've seen that um, or, and just help along the way. And I think I've seen that multiple times in our clinic. So our wheelchair providers uh, of, of for our mobility clinic. So we have an on-call person who comes to assess uh, wheelchair issues um, at the clinic. And so that's very helpful um, along the way too for um, any kind of needs that might come up a lot. Uh, and that's nice to have sort of almost like a one-stop shop situation where you have, you can come to clinic and see everyone all at once. Um, we have our orthotist that we work with regularly too to make um, for all the bracing needs evaluations as well. And we have a good relationship with our uh, GI folks that um, when we need to kind of assess with speech therapy and nutrition for maintaining weight, whether it be um, you don't want to have too high, high of a weight either or to or start losing weight. So it's a fine balance. Um, and I think we have a good relationship with folks here for that. It's very important for the swallow evaluations that are needed. Um, genetics, as I mentioned, and the other specialties, psychiatry, neuropsychology, social work, are all sort of um, specialties that we also collaborate with and coordinate with as well along the way. Um, so I would say the benefits to quality of life or for how I see our clinic functioning is reducing the travel burden of having to, you know, spend every day going to like of a week going to a different um, doctor in a different location. A lot of our patients travel for many hours away, um, so they don't want to have to come back and forth um, you know, for multiple appointments with different providers so they can, that can be prevented and everyone can see everyone at once. So that really reduces the travel burden significantly uh, and also streamlines the care and the quality of care um, ultimately is improved. Um, I think anticipatory guidance that I mentioned that is along the lines of reducing the need for sort of disruptive admission to the hospital or just, you know, discomfort in general. So say, for example, the need for mobility support. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, maybe you don't think that you need the rollator when the cane's kind of doing it, but then there's a lot of falls happening and you don't want to break a bone and then end up admitted to the hospital with a broken hip. Um, so kind of assessing those needs and kind of reassessing them frequently is really helpful for anticipating sort of what could potentially happen. Um, cough assist device and BiPAP I mentioned are kind of things that we need to prevent like admissions to the hospital for pneumonia or something like that. Of like routine flu vaccinations, just kind of reinforcing that as well is really important. Um, any kind of anesthesia recommendations prior to surgery, sometimes um, patients aren't aware that malignant hyperthermia is a risk with certain sort of depolarizing anesthetic agents. And so um, those are things that we can kind of bring up and discuss. And going along those lines, like uh, we always hand out a list of medications to patients who have myasthenia gravis who come to our clinic of things that they should avoid that can cause potential exacerbations of their myasthenia. And we have a handout on a sheet and we also have it on our little card that we hand out to them in a clinic so they can carry that around. And when, you know, go to the primary care doctor and need an antibiotic for say a urinary tract infection, can say, well, you know, don't give me any fluoroquinolones because that's going to like probably make my myasthenia worse on top of this. So I think that's like a really, um, that's prevented a lot of issues for patients. So we always kind of hand those out to them and uh, provide that to any other provider who wants to reach out to us as well. Um, another example of that would be, say, mitochondrial myopathy and the toxicity related to certain anti-epileptics like Depakote, for example, and kind of the use of what's appropriate and what's not, and just being familiar with those disease processes helps us to kind of care for our patients along the way and anticipate what might be needed as things progress and um, change. And I think um, what's really been amazing is the telehealth, um, if this might be the one benefit of the pandemic, is that our infrastructure for telehealth, like just immediately uh, overnight, turned into like a really good resource for us to be able to communicate with patients who were um, having a lot of issues with traveling to our clinic and couldn't make it here as often as they needed to. And so we're able to utilize that 
as an improvement to their quality of life, be able to continue to help and support them, even though they can't make it here in person. So I think that's been really, really a nice feature to be able to offer. And um, other things beyond the clinic walls of things that we're trying to sort of over time develop or other things like mobile health apps that you can use uh, to monitor function, remote monitoring platforms and things of that nature, support groups as well to kind of um, get resources, advocacy groups and kind of building up uh, sort of awareness for the disease process and treatment and research options has really been important too for building knowledge and awareness. Um, ongoing management in the clinic. So I can't say enough about coordination of care with the different providers that we regularly work with. So they can feel free to reach out and ask a question anytime. We know where to reach everybody and we can sort of coordinate all of that as soon as possible and make it way more efficient. Um, and then the anticipatory guidance like I talked about and therapy services, of course, throughout um, and the wheelchair vendor support, those are all very key features of our kind of ongoing management and our close ties with other key ancillary services and specialties is important as well. So, you know, depending on where you are, um, interventional radiology versus a gastroenterologist might be, um, one might be better than the other for feeding tube placement, for example, and, um, you know, it depends on uh, your support network and who will care for that tube after it's been placed. And so um, I think those are things to be aware of in local sites uh, where you can know and we know here what we can provide. And I think home care provider networks is, are also very well established and our nurse coordinator knows all the contacts to like reach out to those people directly so we can kind of help provide that um, and support needs as they are needed as people. Um, as people need them. So nutrition services as well. So it's, it's uh, sort of, um, you know, lots of things going on um, in the process um, along the way. I think uh, there's some mention sometimes of, you know, metrics to measure the quality of care. I think that's sometimes difficult to measure. Um, of course, there's direct costs and indirect costs for things. Um, but I think that ultimately an MDA clinic and an interdisciplinary clinic ends up being um, of high value. And so, um, you can look at costs of outpatient visits or hospitalizations versus, you know, places who have multidisciplinary clinics versus those who don't. Um, I'm sure that one would find that it's uh, more effective to have uh, more providers all together talking to one another, kind of being your patient care team. Um, so I think that probably would make the most sense. Um, genetics. Uh, so we do have a geneticist that we reach out to who comes to clinic as needed. And so I think there's a couple components of this. One is once the diagnosis is established, of course, we can talk and provide information about those particular diagnoses that are acquired or hereditary or genetic. But I think um, also it's helpful for um, coming to clinic for family members too. Um, we reach out to her to do counseling uh, for extended family. We also have resources to uh, kind of locate the best place to send that genetic testing to as far as, far as cost goes. Sometimes that can be an issue. And then uh, another thing about uh, genetics too, as far as, you know, research uh, goes and clinical trials often require a genetic diagnosis sometimes for enrollment or treatments like for Spinraza or Rizaplan. Um, those sometimes require, you know, they require documentation for genetics for insurance companies. So having our geneticists available to come explain those things and discuss the counseling as well, and then having us available to kind of help facilitate those things. Um, even once your genetic diagnosis is established, potentially other family members might be interested so we can help with that as well. Um, community, community support resources, so uh, patient support groups. Uh, we had some patients here, for example, who um, have inclusion body mastitis and uh, formed a support group with one another in the area. So they um, kind of offline, not on like a Facebook sort of thing, but just in, in a group here. So we have a very cohesive kind of group of folks here who are helping support one another. And then of course our support resources of our home care services that we have um, with our networks are um, who are familiar with the disease process and usually are able to kind of, um, because we can communicate with them directly, it just works out so much better. And I can't say enough about really getting to know our patients that helps so much with um, 
when you reach out to call or message or um, see us once a year, uh, we can know how to care for you better when we know your support network and how things are for you and getting to know you. So it's, I can't emphasize that enough as a really important part of continuity of care. Uh, one example of a patient that we'd followed annually for, um, I had FSHD, um, and he, you know, initially had some mild weakness that progressed over the years, and we had reassessment of mobility needs by people who knew how to help him. Um, and then, uh, you know, at one point, he needed a functional capacity evaluation in order to kind of help with some of the work-related limitations that he had that we could help provide. And then as a secondary, you know, he felt comfortable enough to reach out and say, well, my mom's developing some weakness too, but she's like a lot older than me. Like, how could this be FSH? Maybe it's something else. And so we were able to kind of bring her into the clinic and assess things and, and kind of help with her diagnosis, which was sort of a later onset, sort of milder um, manifestation of, of FSH actually. So, um, so I think that is one example of sort of a case of ongoing management where we kind of helped along the way with him and his family, but also, uh, because these diagnoses are rare, uh, sometimes providers in the community or primary care doctors just don't know, and they will um, kind of say, well, it's all, you know, the CMT or it's all the myasthenia, even though, you know, maybe it's not. And so a uh, patient with um, and his CMT came to clinic and come every year and had really stable weakness, a foot drop and hand weakness, um, but developed some hip pain and um, was just told, you know, well, it's probably some arthritis and probably your CNT. And no one really was looking further into it. And so when he came here, we evaluated him and did a hip exam and, and it was really asymmetric, which was just on one side. And so, um, you know, got imaging studies that led us down the path of discovering that he had very severe erosive sort of arthritis with a femoral head collapse of that hip and so had needed a hip replacement. And so I think that's one example of kind of knowing what's related and what's not and coming here um, and reaching out to us when we know what, what you know, how to distinguish um, what's the rare disease process, what's the actual, there can be other things going on that aren't related that we can help manage. And so that's another aspect of continuity of care here. Um, there was a patient that we saw with myasthenia gravis who had some weakness. Um, oftentimes it's not weakness in the hands related to myasthenia, but sometimes it can be. And so she had weakness in the upper extremities and the shoulders, but also the hands and the legs. And um, so she had some worsening weakness in her hands and uh, wasn't sure if that was the myasthenia that was doing it or something else. And so when we evaluated her in clinic, um, determined she needed some more sort of um, electrodiagnostic testing and we found that she actually had an sort of a C8 radiculopathy. So she had an abnormal kind of nerve root sort of inflammation and some arthritis up there. And so she was able to seek appropriate care for that. So to prevent any progression of weakness there. So in fact, it wasn't the myasthenia, but something else. So there's, um, there's that to keep in mind as well. So. Um, so, of course, we always um, research opportunities for the patients. So, with our MDA clinics, typically are in tertiary care centers. So, we're often approached to help run clinical trials, but also out there, um, you know, you can look for yourself to look and see uh, what clinical trials are available if you're interested in that sort of thing. And so, um, those are the two websites I often provide to our patients when we're looking at those or our own opportunities that we have available here as well. And it's just really amazing. Um, just I took this from the MDA website of uh, the sort of funded research from the MDA that's been sponsored of the developments over the years of treatments. So it's just been really, really amazing, and especially of late. There's been sort of such an um, explosion of different treatments and options. So it's been really exciting. And I would say that we have a fair number of spinal muscular atrophy patients in our MDA clinic. And so I, I remember that you probably heard a little bit about this from Dr. Damaki's talk, but I think um, it bears mentioning a little bit more and to say that, uh, yeah, I remember one of my patients like right the next day after FDA approval for Spinraza contacted me to start uh, that treatment. And she's been, very stable and doing work pretty well um, since that time. And then it's just you know, the gene therapy was approved for children. And then more recently, Ristaplan was just approved as um, a nice alternative option compared to um, Spinraza, um, just because of the uh, mechanism of, of taking it is um, 
a lot easier to administer, uh, but we have a couple of patients that have transitioned over to that as well, which has been very exciting too to see. And um, I would just say, just, you know, spinraza is intrathecal administration, so you have to go into spinal fluids. So we've worked really closely with our interventional radiologists here in order to set that up. So we work and collaborate with them. They go, they sort of, um, to make it easier on the patients, they, uh, you know, use fluoroscopy or CT in order to get into that space, the CSF space very quickly and don't have to struggle with that at the bedside or anything. Um, and so that's, um, I think ultimately better for, for patients. Um, and then we um, kind of collab, we get paged and go down there and, and push the drug. And I think that's like a, you know, we're working together to kind of help care for everybody. And I think that's been working out pretty well um, overall. And, um, but I'm very excited about the oral daily treatment that we've now recently approved. And so I think that's gonna be a nice sort of other option for folks that don't wanna come here for, um, for that, but can, can just do that at home. So it's pretty amazing and different options now available. Um, I would say also that, you know, the recent advances uh, development of novel therapies also depends on patient involvement too, and these are rare diseases, and I think that's why we always um, include our residents and fellows in training more clinicians to be aware of and recognize these uh, processes and understand them a little better so that you know how to care for patients best. Um, so I think I'll say, maybe I talked a little bit quickly, but <laughs> which I usually do, uh, but I think I, I would just thank you very much for your time. Thank you. My, um, all right, here we go. All right, thank you, Dr. Gable. Um, we got a couple questions in. Um, we got one earlier this morning, and I wanted to save it um, to ask you, and it's around COVID. They were interested in, um, obviously, the COVID vaccine for Duchenne in particular, and she was curious, is one vaccine preferred over another? No. Mm -mm. Okay. Yeah. I think if any, yeah, I don't think there's really any preference. Yeah. Mm -mm. Okay. All right. And then if you could revert back to your table number one, this person had a, a question, how do the recommendations in table one change for an adult? Mm -hmm. um, mostly the ways I, I summarized, I think prop, like for the most part, it ends up being a matter of, uh, for most of the things, it ends up being more of a pulmonary cardiology, sort of once a year, sometimes twice a year, depending on the need, and neurology, like at least once a year. Um, for, and then therapy, vis, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy um, at the um, clinic visits at least once to twice a year, um, and, then, and then as needed, depending on you know, what um, evolves or what's needed throughout the year, um, but that's typically sort of the standard. Okay, all right. Um, and how would one go about getting a list of medications to avoid? They have CNT1A and um, is it Ehlers-Danos 111? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would they, how do they know what they shouldn't take and what they should take? Oh, for CMT? Mm -hmm. uh, I probably to recommend going to the CMT sort of, you know, uh, website. There's a association for CMT, then that would probably be the best resource for that. Okay. Perfect. All right, Dr. Gable, I do not see anything else. So thank you for your time.